uh, science didn't develop in vacuum, right? It developed in Western Christendom uh, in the Middle Ages, and you know it was very theologically motivated. So the assumption that we can understand the world, that there's something there to understand and that we're capable of understanding it and that the universe is ordered uh, and that the universe is not God, that God is separate from the universe. And so it's not sacrilegious to study the universe. All of that stuff are uh, important Christian assumptions that end up uh, ended up being really critical for the development of science in the uh, in the Middle Ages. Welcome to the pair review. We are very excited to be joined by three guests this time discussing an article they posted on the heterodox stem substack regarding the relationship between science and religion. Uh, we are pleased to to introduce Wes Farrell, Dorian Abbott, and Daniel Selveratnam. Uh, so uh, thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, and I'm going to call you up to introduce yourselves so that you, you know, I, uh, I make people know all that's important about you. So I'll start with, uh, with Wes, uh, please. Can you give us a quick uh, background on yourself? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me, Carlos. Uh, my name is Wes Farrell. I'm a fourth year assistant professor of chemistry at the United States Naval Academy. Uh, I maintain a lab doing organometallic research, um, looking at old metathesis with vanadium. Um, we're also getting into some more polymer synthesis now with applications uh, for binders of energetic materials. Thanks so much, Daniel. Hey guys. Um, yeah, I'm a postdoc at the University of Melbourne. It's my second year as a postdoc. Um, I'm in the electrical eng department, um, working in control systems um, and autonomous systems. Um, so yeah, after my PhD, I went to industry for a year and a half um, and I worked in defense and I realized I wanted to be an academic. So I came back just as COVID started. I might ask you some stuff about that because I went from academia to academia. Don't know what it's like outside. So um, Okay, uh, thanks so much. So Dorian, uh, please. Uh, my name is Doran Abbott. I'm a professor at University of Chicago, and most of my research right now is about planetary atmospheres and planetary dynamics. All right, welcome everyone. So uh, if we could jump right into it, um, the article is quite short, but I think we could still uh, enjoy a recap from one of you guys that we didn't agree on who. So if you guys, uh, whoever wants to jump in, we'd love an intro on what's what was the motivation? Uh, what were your findings or your, what, what kind of conclusions you, you drew from it? And um, any other background would be really good to have so before we start the discussion. Who's the you first can also author? pull up the paper, right? Yeah, I'm going to pull you it can up pull right up now. pull up the paper also. I'll let you guys choose who wants to uh, give a quick recap uh, while I pull it up. I also well, got involved in the comments section, got into a bit of a, there's some fun comments on it too. I'll talk about the background. So the background is we have, there's this group called the Heterodox, Heterodox Academy, um, which is sort of an academic group for people who want to promote free expression and um, free exchange of ideas, even ideas that other people might disagree with, which is an unpopular thing right now on most university campuses. And uh, Anna Krilov and Luana Mayorja and I started the Heterodox STEM group through the Heterodox Academy. And then we, so we have an email list where we talk about ideas. And uh, through that, we sort of it got proposed that we should start a sub stack. Now the sub stack is not explicitly associated with the Heterodox Academy. It's just Heterodox STEM. It's not Heterodox Academy STEM. So it's just Heterodox thinkers or Heterodox thoughts for STEM people. And so that's what, you know, where this thing got posted. And through that listserv, there's sort of an interesting, so right now there's, there's, a, there's, there's a group of people that sometimes called 
uh, woke or sometimes called social justice activists uh, who are kind of have moved out of the women's studies department or ex studies departments and are trying to uh, take over STEM. And most of the discussion on the heterodox STEM listserv is about, you know, how to respond to that and maintain scientific integrity, uh, uh, standards, and high quality work. And sort of what I noticed as part of this was that there were sort of two camps on there who were not happy with the woke uh, social justice activists uh, power grab that uh, one camp could be described as kind of like new atheists. And the other camp seemed to be Christians. Uh, what they share in common is that they both believe that there's such a thing as truth uh, and, and that there are, that morality exists and should be, and that there's some sort of objective morality. It's not just a power-based morality. Um, and so, you know, I noticed that these two guys were writing from a Christian perspective, and I proposed to them that we should write some sort of explanation of how, you know, science and Christianity is consistent to be a scientist and a Christian because some people think that it's not. So that's sort of the origin of, of this uh, paper, but maybe someone else can give a summary of what, what we Yes, uh, I'm happy to talk about the the essay a little bit. It's not really a, a paper. I know you guys talk a lot about like scientific papers. Uh, this is not like a, a research paper or anything. It's just us uh, exploring these ideas. Uh, and like Dorian said, we kind of realized that we were on the same page uh, from at least a theological perspective. And yeah, I think we, we just wanted to make the case that these things are not mutually exclusive, that you can have faith and specifically Christian faith uh, and be a scientist. So we go through a, you know, a bit of a, a thought experiment or a story about a a young boy who you know asked his mom why the water's blue and uh, she gives him some explanation eventually said you know because god made it that way um not finding him that to be very satisfying he then goes and you know studies physics and optics and all this kind of stuff um but at the end of the day still doesn't really find the answer that he's really looking for which is you know why is it that way not just how can i explain that it's that way but like why in the grand scheme of the universe is it that way uh, and from there, we kind of go into talking just about um, the history of the sign that was important to me, just how the church generally, uh, the Catholic Church, but Christianity generally has really, um, in many ways, given birth, I think, to uh, science as we now know it. So the scientific method and the idea that there is truth uh, and it can be learned and realized that the universe is at, is ordered and can be understood. Um, so that's kind of uh, how I view this. So uh, my, I guess my first thing to kick it off with would be, um, and I kind of picked this up from looking at the comments, but wouldn't a scientist say, well, there's a point where we don't have an explanation anymore. And that's as far as science goes. Like, you know, the good thing about science is that it can only explain as far as it's been tested. And then you can say, well, why is the sky blue? You know what, what's the ultimate reason for the sky being blue we don't know and that's as far as science goes and they they would say well religion makes that leap that science is not willing to make so is is there a, a kind of difference at that level yeah go ahead Dorian. well I, I think one thing is that's a little misleading because by assuming that you can use the scientific method at all you're making a leap by assuming that uh, your brains are rational and that you can uncover the truth, you're making a leap. So I don't think that uh, that dichotomy you set up is accurate. Yeah, that's fair. But I guess, yeah, go on, Perry, go on. Sorry, I was gonna say like, what, 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 what is the truth then, right? Is it just something we experience or are we assuming now that there's some global, there's like a, an objective truth outside of our experience? Yeah, well, um, everyone has to assume really some objective truth. I don't think you can actually get by without that. Even the claim that there is no truth is a truth claim. Um, so, and I, I, I guess um, many scientists and engineers in particular, right, they, the assumption or the unconscious assumption is that science is this self-sustaining worldview and that it's enough. 
Um, and I think we wrote this to kind of show, well, no, it's not self-sustaining. Um, yeah, it needs, it needs some foundation. So I think, again, drawing to the comments, one of the people was saying, one of the commenters was saying that, well, you can verify that science works in the real world. You come up with a theory, uh, that theory explains some phenomenon or it predicts that something will happen and then it happens. That's some kind of evidence that goes towards science, but then maybe then you can say, well, you have to have faith in what constitutes evidence or something like that, I would guess, right, Daniel? Um, yeah, sure. So this is a um, right. So let's take the the argument that well, you can verify from your observations that science works. But no, you can't because you're still assuming that your observations are are there to even make that, and and you're and you're still making an argument. And so to make an argument, you're assuming that your reasoning process is valid. So you end up begging the question by assuming the very things that you're trying to prove. And just to clarify for everyone. Daniel is using the word begging the question like philosophers use it, which means assume the answer. It, it's not uh, begging the question informally sometimes means makes you want to ask the question, but this is a technical term for philosophers. It means assume the answer. Yeah, you assume it, the answer from the start. So then couldn't, I mean, okay, so you have to make some leap of faith, right? And even if you had some religious belief that belief would also be some kind of unsubstantiated or I, I mean if you're if you're claiming that science and religion both have to make a leap of faith how do you choose between them or maybe you don't have to choose so what lets you distinguish between possible explanations for which you have to base them on axioms right go ahead Wes. Yeah, I think one of the distinctions we're making in this essay, um, and we've got some pushback on it from some, is that what we're saying is that there's a difference between the questions being asked. There's how questions and why questions. So, you know, we can explain why it is that when I drop an object out my window, it falls you know, with an acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared, but it doesn't tell us anything about the why. Like, why is the world the way that it is from, you know, a more universal perspective? And you know, we know that the Earth is here and going all the way back to the Big Bang. And we can explain that and we can predict you know, how fast the universe expands. But you know, why is that? You know, I think what, at least for me, speaking for myself, it's this more fundamental question of why is anything the way that it is? Or, or why is there anything? Um, that's kind of the question that I think religion can answer. Um, I think Christianity can answer. And I don't think science is able to do that yet. And I'd, Frankly, don't think it can. Um, and you know, I say that as a practicing scientist. You know, I, I do it all the time. Um, I, I love science. I just think it it, it only works for certain things. Um, these global, universal things fall short. Have you guys uh, read uh, Alvin Plantinga? Yeah. yeah, I taught him. I taught okay. a course uh, on science and Christianity at the University of Chicago, and we had some readings from him. Yeah, I was just reading his uh, book on the conflict, where the conflict really lies uh, between science, naturalism, and evolution, or something like that. And he, in, in there, he says that, I guess, science assumes that your way of knowing things can only come through the faculties of, of like empirical interactions with the world, whereas you could also gain knowledge from other faculties that you might have, and he calls these, like, I think, uh, I forgot what it's called, but it, 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 you can have some sense in your in your sort of mind that points you towards other truths that aren't necessarily empirical truths, right? So I think people often might try to, you know, say that just because faith doesn't arise from the same uh, knowledge source as science, that somehow it's not as valid. You might know more about that, Dorian, but I, that kind of rang a bell when I when I was reading this stuff. Yeah, I guess I would just, you're sort of hinting at a distinction that sometimes is made. You're not saying it yourself, but that there's some sort of faith reason distinction. And I think part of the point here is to uh, push back against that. And so it's not like, oh, one, on one side, there's faith and on one side, there's reason. It's that both, both the scientific approach to the world and the Christian approach to the world both involve uh faith in certain things and reason and evidence right like you know the the christian perspective is not just i have faith in a bunch of gobbledygook 
it's, it, you know, you, you're not supposed to have faith in things that are, that are impossible. You, you have faith sometimes in things that are, uh, go beyond what we can observe, uh, personally in, and reproduce in experiments, but that's right. a different sort of, that's a different sort of an object that we're dealing with. Uh, so that, that's, that's, that's one thing that I would add there. Yeah, so I guess we measure the validity of a scientific theory based on empirical evidence. We can measure the validity of a religious belief by some other measurement, right? We have to be able to distinguish between non-scientific beliefs, right? And I, I guess that's trickier to see than just like, well, check if your theory works by measuring and, and see if it doesn't, right? Well, yeah, I mean, it involves the theological reasoning and tradition and uh, scriptures and all these other sources of evidence. Daniel, you wanted to say something? Yeah, like I, th I think still some version of the scientific method is the best way we have to determine whether something's true. So even for things outside the scope of science, um, you're still, it's, it's still, um, you look at its predictive power like you look at how well this religious framework actually explains the world you see in front of you um and so you can evaluate things based on those means um yeah okay. and then the other another point that we make in that paper that's important to mention is that uh, science didn't develop in vacuum right it developed in western christendom uh in the middle ages and you know it was very theologically motivated. So the assumption that we can understand the world, that there's something there to understand, and that we're capable of understanding it, and that the universe is ordered, uh, and that the universe is not God, that God is separate from the universe, and so it's not sacrilegious to study the universe. All of that stuff are uh, important Christian assumptions that end up uh, ended up being really critical for the development of science in the uh, in the Middle Ages, and so there's a book Finkelstein. We cited this book Finkelstein, and this is an atheist uh, Israeli Jew who wrote. That's who Finkelstein was, uh, and he makes this point very very strongly. And so I think people have to grapple with that at least. You know, e even if we're going to be atheist scientists now we have to at least acknowledge that the source of science is western christendom at least the modern incarnation of what we consider science so i i think i can understand that uh, there are some assumptions that go into just using the scientific method or just applying science or some some faith involved in that as daniel mentioned earlier i think um but can't we just think of science as a way of describing what our senses observe or predicting what our senses can observe. And so we, we don't have to care about the faith involved. We just, uh, you know, make some observation and then predict based on those observations uh, without having to rely on any faith whatsoever. Yeah, um, so I, I, I understand your question. I, I think, yeah, it does do a good job of describing these things. Uh, it has a lot, a lot of predictive power, but that doesn't tell us, you know, how to live. It doesn't tell us, you know, what, why are we here? And, you know, how should we behave with that knowledge? For instance, you know, we just lived or, you know, perhaps even still are living through this pandemic. Like we can understand the genome of the coronavirus. We can understand, you know, ways of mitigating its spread and stuff like that. But that doesn't tell us anything about the morality or the ethics of, of how we should behave with that information. It's the same thing, you know, I mean, I'm not at all like a, a nuclear scientist or anything, so I hope I don't sound like too much like, a, you know, like a tool here, but, you know, we can use nuclear physics to, you know, create power or we can create weapons. You know, those are two very different things used for very different purposes. And I think having this moral foundation rooted, and in our case, in Christianity um, is important and they can go hand in hand. Um, and I think what Dorian's saying, you know, I think there's a lot of philosophers and people who talk about ethics and morality who are probably atheists but they're even they are bringing all of their thoughts together in this world that has been built in the west by mostly christianity and there's other religions of course too and i don't mean to discount them but um you know we are focusing on christianity because that's the faith that we have and 
So I think at the end of the day, it doesn't help get to these root questions, um, which is what is really always, as I've grown as a scientist, you know, from a young kid who just wanted to play around with a, like an experimental set to, you know, being in my job now, uh, it's continually brought me back to the church. Yeah. And what I would add to that is the argument you're, you're setting out a very sort of limited claim about what science is and what it can accomplish. And I think within that claim, you can imagine people of various different faiths and atheists using science, right? And, but there, a claim has been advanced that there's a competition and that science is somehow replacing Christianity. And that's a very different claim. And so part of the point of this argument is kind of pushing back against that and saying, look, you know, it's perfectly reasonable to be a Christian and to be a scientist, because as you say, science really concerns, you know, making these observations, uh, making it consistent with, with predictions and stuff. But science is not, it's not a bulldozer that's going to uh, somehow replace the place of religion and society. It's just not set up to do that. It doesn't have the capability. So I, I think where, where there's maybe the biggest counter argument to that is as when you start studying evolution and how it could possibly, uh, you know, shape the way we, we reason about morality, right? So someone might say, well, you know, the moral thing is whatever that leads to this maximizing the survival of the species. And that's why we shouldn't make nuclear bombs with uh, nuclear energy, right? Um, and I, I wonder uh, if you guys have any thoughts about that. I've thought about that a lot myself, but it's, it's a tricky one. Yeah, but that's just an arbitrary assumption. What, like, why would that be the moral thing? That's not actual morality. That's just saying like, oh, I've decided that this is the thing I want to maximize. I have a cost function. I have defined my cost function. It, it, you know, morality is something that's, that's uh, a part. It's aside from your assumptions. It exists out, out there. Yeah, I guess that's an assumption that morality exists, then that it's not just some like pattern of behavior that arises from a bunch of molecules, right? It's not an assumption. That's what morality is. If it's just a pattern of behavior, then it's, just, it's a different thing. It's not morality. It's some other thing. Yeah, so we have to assume good, morality good, exists. We could say there's no such thing as morality. Yeah, exactly. And therefore, we're going, to, we're going to define this Cox function and maximize it. Maybe it's a utilitarian cost function, or maybe it's an evolutionary cost function. But that's, that's not morality when you play that game. Yeah, and, and even that, like, I don't think anyone can get away from the idea of absolute morality. Because even the defining of that cost function, you're making that fine. That's absolute morality you're always um, bringing it back to some ultimate principle. And the idea that, well, uh, so morality is just what evolution brought about to maximize the survival of the species. Like, I, I mean, there's obviously big arguments that can be had, but it just doesn't seem true in daily life. Like, are the most moral people the ones who have the greatest reproductive success? Like, no. Um, so... Yeah, I would add that I think sometimes we look at people who have had lots of reproductive success um, and we think about them uh, not in a positive way. You know, some guy who's got, you know, 20 kids and he doesn't know any of the moms really like, you know, we don't view that as a as a moral win. Um, and if you think just about, you know, maximizing, you know, your the number of your offspring, you can think about, you know, there's a lot of animals that don't you know really a lot about consent um but we value that greatly as humans uh at least we should um that has to come from somewhere um you know you could maximize the amount of reproductive success you have uh in ways that are not moral so mm -hmm. I, I that's where i kind of come back to i think this has to come from somewhere else um and that's i think that comes from christianity and i think you could also say that well even if morality did come about as you know, through natural selection or group selection or kin selection somehow, that doesn't mean that it's not true, right? That doesn't mean that maybe, you know, it wasn't put there for a reason and that it, there's actually something behind it. Uh, just understanding the mechanism by which it functions doesn't really tell you much about, you know, why it's there in the first place, like you're saying. Yeah, um, so C.S. Lewis makes this point where so may, maybe there is some physical mechanism by which it comes about, right? But you have to assume it's more than just that, because if it's just a physical mechanism, there's no reason to obey it. Like there's a whole bunch of instincts we all have that evolved, that evolved um, 
hunger, the desire for sex, the need for, you know, um, head, you know, maintaining good relationships with your community. And we can choose to turn any of them off. Um, we can choose to turn morality off as well. Like, but morality is a thing that we can't just, that we ought not to do. And that way. But I'm, I'm just wondering if maybe um, this notion of morale, maybe it's, I'm, I'm repeating this. Can you can, uh, Carlos was just making the point that he, the, whatever the mechanism is, if we actually believe that it's morality, then uh, if it's actually true and we actually are bound to do it, then it's pointing at something beyond the mechanism. Yeah. But like, if you're not bound to do it, then yeah. I mean, if it really is just something that we evolved and there's nothing beyond, nothing uh, anchoring it, then you're not bound to do it. So like, why would you be bound to do something? You know, I've, I'm evolved to uh, want to eat lots of donuts, but that doesn't mean I'm bound to eat lots of donuts. I might eat them or I might not eat them. So that's, that's sort of the issue. Well, I think there's an assumption about free will there, right? I mean, some people will say you don't have free will. You're just a mechanism. You, you were going to eat those donuts regardless, right? Or not eat them. Yeah. Uh, how do those people organize their lives and interact with other people? <laughs> well, the funny thing is I talk to people like that actually say these things, right? I mean, I, and that there's a cost function that you can just choose and that we're going to sort of construct society that way. And I actually, maybe, maybe this ties back to the way you kicked off the, the conversation, Dorian, about how, uh, you know, there's certain ideologies that are, that are becoming really prevalent right now in, in society and universities. And I, I wonder if, that kind of thinking, you know, uh, of thinking we can just sort of identify the correct narrative. Uh, it's the one that's, that's backed by science and we're gonna shape society around it. Uh, if, if sort of this disconnection with faith or, or, or this illusion that we're disconnected from it maybe is harming society in some way. I don't know what you guys think about that. Yes. <laughs> So, so we often get into some debates like sometimes where uh, it seems like the argument is always, well, science tells you to do this, but it seems like science maybe cannot tell you to do anything, right? Maybe there's some moral backing to your decision. Science can observe things and predict things, but then you have to make a decision based on some other factors on what to do based on the information. But it seems like, and a lot of times it's just like, oh, science says do this or science says do that, but that seems like an empty statement. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Car Carlos, you reminded me of a Chesterton quote, which is something like atheism doesn't lead you to believing in nothing, it leads you to believing in anything. One of the other guys can correct me if I got that wrong. Yeah, sounds right. No, that's right. And I think um, yeah, that's one of the things that I was thinking about is, you know, I think there's, there's, I think in science, is, I looked at the stats on this, I, and I'm not going to repeat them because I don't remember exactly, I don't want to misquote them, but there's a large number of scientists who do identify as atheists, but you know, I think in our current world, like we think, I think these people think they're science, or they think they're atheists, but in reality, they just filled that void with something else, I think. And I think they filled it with science um, or just themselves in some ways. And, you know, I think just again, living through this pandemic, I've seen um, people selling votive candles to Anthony Fauci, um, which normally people reserve for saints. Um, and also I saw some of the sticker on their car where I work that says, in Fauci, we trust. So they just took God and replaced Fauci. It's like, and I know that's probably a joke and it's tongue in cheek, but I think it does speak to something where someone, you know, if this person is an atheist, I think he or she is filling something there with that. Um, and again, I think it comes back to the decision-making. Like, you know, I mean, Dorian knows more, much more about climate science than I do. Um, we should all be concerned about the climate and the environment, but that's not, again, it's not gonna tell us how we should behave on a global level in order to best address this real issue. And I think in many ways, when we don't have that grounding, it leads us to make bad decisions overall. It leads you to make decisions with climate, like maybe where you say, okay, there's no, you know, we don't want any oil or anything like that. And it's like, that's great for us because we live in a, in a wealthy country, uh, which is very fortunate, but 
there are many people I think need that reliable, inexpensive form of energy, even if it's as dirty as coal, in order to simply survive. So I, I, that's where I think that this, just having science and using that or making it into your God really fails us as the human race. Yeah, and you just reminded me, uh, I, the route I take my dog on a walk, there's a progressive creedal statement uh, posted outside somebody's uh, house. And it says, you know, in this house, we believe that science is real, that no people are illegal, that Black Lives Matter, that blah de blah. It's this whole creedal statement. And it's very interesting because it's, it's, very, it's a very explicit transition from a sort of... Uh, uh, born again Protestantism to atheism. It's a post born again Protestant to atheist, uh, and and it's very important to post that creedal statement outside and make sure everyone knows exactly what you believe, which is very interesting. And so it's it's an example of exactly what Wes was mentioning. So what do you what do you think happened that caused this flip? Was was there something that uh, turned people away from religious thinking and substituting it with with science. W where do you think are the origins of this? I think it's probably important at some point here to mention that we're all uh, practicing scientists and not uh, sociologists or theologians or whatever. So anything that we say is, you, you know, everyone should take that with a grain of salt. Yeah, I should have put this yeah. on the start. We're well, all scientists not, not about, don't believe about us. Issues like that, about issues like that. Not about, I mean, I've covered yeah. it in the stuff we said in the article, but about issues like what you just Yeah, I mean, I do have like some hypotheses, which is that science is just, you know, accelerated so, you know, immensely. You know, we went from not being able to fly in the early 1900s to putting someone on the moon in like 1969. Like that's an incredible rate of just transformation in science and engineering and technology. I think that it has advanced so much and we can explain so much and, you know, kind of continue using this example. We made a vaccine for this virus in under a year. Like the pace at which science happens now, the way we can understand things is just incredible. And I think that may contribute to the feeling that people feel like, well, what do we need? You know, what do we need church for? What do we need God for? We have, we, now we have the answers. Um, and I think I have heard people say something along those lines where it's like, you know, what do we need it for anymore? And that's, I think is a little bit arrogant. That's like, I think that's knocking out the foundation from under your house. Cause you're like, oh, I've got this beautiful house. What do I need the foundation for? It's like, well, that's what holds it up. I see one important part of it as uh, the desire to for the modern conception of freedom. The ancient conception of freedom is uh, the ability to abstain from your desires so that you can pursue virtue. In modernity, the conception of freedom is the ability to exercise any desire uh, with no constraint. And so there's been a change in the conception. And the problem is that in most religion, most religions, put constraints on your ability to exercise your desires. And so they become undesirable. And so the rest of it is kind of ways, clever arguments to reason around uh, religion in order to uh, maintain full expression of desires. And so Sartre said, uh, the, there, there is, if, if there is God, then I'm not free. And I am free, therefore there's no God. And I think reasoning goes something like that. I, I don't want my behavior to be constrained. Therefore, I want to argue against these things that would appear to constrain my behavior in various ways. Yeah, just um, a quick point that, you know, I think Joy raised an interesting point there. And this idea of, you know, wanting to be free to do anything. Um, if any of the listeners are interested, uh, Patrick Deenan from Notre Dame wrote an interesting book recently called Why Liberalism Failed. Liberalism meaning, you know, like Western liberal democracy uh, and has a strong thesis in the sense that this it has led a lot of the woes that we see in Western democracies these days come from this idea that we want to be free to do whatever it is we want um, and a very individualistic um, mentality there. And um, I think it's also worth mentioning, like this bent away from God, it's, it goes back to the biblical doctrine of the fall, right? Like we all have a bent to deny the true God and turn away from him 
as much as possible. And whenever anything comes up that allows us to do that and maintain plausible deniability, mankind takes it. So science has provided that in this most recent iteration, but this is all as old as. Yeah, I guess it's uh, you, you have a, a Tower of Babel situation, right? Like, uh, yeah, it's crazy that how, like you, you mentioned earlier how you can even verify these religious truths in the real world, just like with science. So that's, that's pretty cool. And I think for me, maybe one component of it is marketing in some way. Like I have to, I've personally in the last five or six years really started to see like the, I guess the legitimacy of, of religious belief. Whereas when I was an undergrad and maybe master student, I was, you know, super into the new atheists and then Jordan Peterson came along and, and really he presented things in a way that at least made me really curious about it and made me think that you know you could actually think about these two systems uh, in, in a harmonious way uh, and actually his Twitter is where I found your article so you know uh, that's pretty cool but yeah I, I, I think there was maybe some kind of lack of, of voices that might present religious belief in a in an appealing way to someone that's been that's been raised in a very scientific worldview yeah so what two th things about that well i guess three things so first that's funny that you mentioned uh he whose name should not be mentioned on a university campus so i guess that you've outed yourself okay the second thing is we talked about the fall of the tower of babel but another uh uh, biblical illusion that I see in this case is the first temptation of Christ. Uh, turn the rocks into bread. And he said, no, man doesn't live on bread alone. And I think that's a little bit of where, you know, where we are here. And then the third thing is, if you could pull up the article again, uh, that we have a bacon quote at the top, which seemed relevant to what you just said, which was, a little philosophy inclineth man's mind to atheism, but death, depth in philosophy bringeth men's minds about to religion. And so it sounds, it sounds like you went through that transition a little bit. And I think, uh, you know, maybe other people might as well. Yeah, for sure. And actually, maybe we can uh, go back again to the article and, and kind of uh, talk about this, the center of it, I think is really nicely laid out. And I, I was wondering, uh, are, are, so you laid out five axioms um, that scientists operate on without necessarily knowing it. Um, and so I guess I'll read them and ask you first, like, how did you come up with this list? Um, so first is the entire physical universe obeys certain laws and these laws do not change with time. Then our observations provide accurate information about reality. I think we touched on that a bit. Uh, the laws of logic yield truth. The human mind recognizes the laws of logic and can apply them correctly. And truth ought to be pursued. So I think we've been circling around these, but how did you guys uh, isolate these and, and do they come from somewhere else? Or did you really try to uh, come up with this? Well, Daniel wrote those five down, so he should explain it. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I just think... Um, I don't know. I, I like identifying the assumptions, hidden assumptions that we make in our worldviews. And I guess just after like a bunch of reading and thinking through these things, these were the things that came to mind. Um, maybe there are others. And I think so you could you could nitpick each of them um, and you could write a thesis on each of them to make it more accurate. Right. But this is just the best way to present it simply and get the main ideas that, yeah, I could find. I guess. So one thing that is maybe tricky for me at least is that there's an assumption here that the laws of logic yield truth and writing this down is an exercise of logic, I would imagine. So uh, is there some circularity that I'm, that I'm like detecting or is it kind of something else? Well, no, it's not a circular, it, it is the uh, assumption. So uh, okay. we're not trying to prove the laws of logic. To make these statements, to have this conversation, to do absolutely anything. The very first assumption you need, really, is that the laws of logic leads truth, and we can actually think logically. Um, yeah, that has to be the starting. Yeah. Okay. But I, I maybe this gets to like the foundations of language or something, right? Because you have to also believe that you can communicate 
statements and they're somehow valid and um, you know in order it, in order to if if we don't necessarily okay no I see I see you just have to assume okay no that makes sense to me <laughs> I, mean, I think part of the point of the writing those down is it's, you know, everyone's got to assume it, right? You can call it a brute fact. That's what uh, Russell would call, call a lot of this stuff. Well, that's just a brute fact. We're going to assume it. But I think the issue is if you, if you take seriously the evolutionary story, you would question whether these are really brute facts. I think that's, that's part of the, of, of the issue we're pointing out. And so just to give you an example, if our goal is to optimize reproduction, uh, you know, why would we think that, why would we have evolved brains that can write down equations that describe the universe? Why would we think that uh, our arguments, like what we're engaging in now, have even the potential to lead to truth instead of just being intricate uh, peacock dances to attract mates you know that sort of a thing but couldn't it be exactly that peacock dances like we, we we want we want to show off how intelligent we are to get mates you know because they appreciate our intelligence and intelligence is correlated with survival but also correlated with you know asking very difficult questions and answering them right but if you go that route then uh now you have reason to doubt the validity of of uh, that you're able to engage in rational argumentation. Your your argumentation may be uh, may not may may just give the appearance of truthfulness and in fact be designed to attract mates. That's yeah. Difficult. Yeah, I, so I think it is. The, yeah, sorry, I was. It is difficult because. I guess at the end of the day, all we have is our observations and what we what we think we know, I guess, even, right? Because like, as you point out, the observation, we're assuming that our observations are, we're observing the truth when we when we observe something. So even, I, I guess it is difficult to understand the whole, uh, the whole picture. I, I think it's part, part of a limitation of being human, right? Is that we cannot have ultimate, absolutely certain knowledge without any assumptions. Um, and so writing down these axioms is a bit of an exercise in humility to say these things we can't prove, these things we all assume, and it seems to be baked into being human, and that's just our limitation. And we have to, all we can do is just make the assumptions and go from there. Do you think any serious scientists would reject that we're actually making these assumptions? Are there any arguments that would challenge them in some way? any one of them if you want to pick or or none of them so back to the article um like i've i've had discussions with well do you really need to make the assumption that they don't change with time and yes i think you do like all of um astronomy and evolutionary biology and all that makes the assumptions that the laws of physics are the same, right? But I mean, you could nitpick a point, but still the necessity for the assumption, the basic premise is still there. You need those assumptions. And I haven't really had any scientist challenge the need for axioms except one person in the comments. So, yeah. I guess what I would say, it, it depends what you mean when you say serious scientist. So, uh, the woke social justice perspective is critiquing a lot of these assumptions and basically saying, you know, science actually, humans can't uh, apply laws of logic. You know, uh, there's, there's like whiteness logic and uh, uh, oppressed logic, et cetera. There's uh, feminist logic and patriarchy logic. And there are different logics that lead you in different directions. And uh, so, are those serious scientists or not? Uh, you know, it depends who you ask, I think. But this, this gets a little bit at this issue of who's on this heterodox academy STEM list. It tends to be, you know, your, uh, uh, I guess you would, people, it tends to be people who accept all these assumptions, let's put it that way. <laughs> but there are plenty of people operating in the STEM space right now who would reject some of these assumptions. 
And is there some utility to rejecting these assumptions for, for that kind of agenda? Like, why is it that these assumptions have to be rejected? So I, I, I think what you're seeing, right, is um, you have, say, um, atheists who believe in these assumptions, but atheism doesn't really provide a framework to defend the assumptions. And so once, once you've made the starting point, there is no God, right? Then you just have these assumptions. And then suddenly someone realizes, well, why, why would any of these assumptions be true? And then you, well, and then you start to question that. And then, um, because I guess the, the laws of physics, all of these things place limitations on you. And you don't want to accept any limitations. You don't want logic to have to dictate your thoughts. You don't want the laws of physics to have to dictate your limitations. And so the convenience behind rejecting them is that, you can play God and be whatever you want to be and say whatever you want to say and nothing can stop. Yeah, and I think the other motivation is uh, if you think that the world is just power dynamics and that all of these rules are just made by powerful people to oppress other people, then uh, you want to attack those rules potentially. Okay, so that's like the the positive spin on it. And the negative spin is there are some people who are making a, a whole buttload of money challenging these assumptions. So think of someone like Ibram Kendi or Robin DiAngelo. So like they're making off like band making out like bandits. And so that's another motivation that can drive people to challenge assumptions or try to knock down existing. Yeah, I just wanted to add, you know, I think when you think about knocking down these assumptions, specifically, you know, just about truth, the, the existence of truth, it calls to mind for me, uh, I forget which gospel it is, but you know, Jesus is before Pontius Pilate, and he says, you know, I am the truth, and Pontius Pilate says, what is truth? And then, of course, you know, he, he goes on and kills Jesus, and in some ways, I think there's a bit of a parallel you can see here, which is that you know, there is this truth to, to the universe, there's a grand logic, and, you know, the, the evil person is the one who kills that. Um, but I think we, I, at least I speaking for myself, want to stay true to that, you know, that there is this truth in the universe, and it can be understood. Uh, and that also comes from scripture, too. So you're saying Pilate as the postmodernist. Uh, you, wow. you know much more about that than I do. I I just know him as uh, <laughs> he's the governor of Rome, wasn't he? Was he not? It was like, I think, proconsul of Palestine, or, you know, I, I don't know what the exact title is. But I forget, but you know, that, that just always sticks out of my mind that he, he even just he throws that question out there. He's like, basically, he is the modern person who thinks that truth is not, is not real. Um, and so I think that's something we should look out for. You know, I think that's one of the fundamental teachings of the gospel. And if you look at the uh, uh, Romans interpretation, it, uh, it would be very similar to what uh, the Roman interpretation of interpersonal relationships would be very similar to uh, Nietzsche's or Foucault's uh, and this idea that it's just brute power. And so the Romans would just, you know, what is truth? Truth is whoever has the brute power to, uh, to impose it. So it is interesting. But then, you know, at the end of the day, the, the truth does prevail. I mean, Jesus rises from the dead three days later. So, you know, I, I, there's, I forget who said this, but someone said, you know, speaking at things just like modern times, like they've killed God, but he isn't dead or something along those lines. Like, you know, even if you physically kill Jesus, like he still reigns supreme. Yeah, it's like uh, you could say, you could say Nietzsche, who said God is dead, is is stock on Good Friday. <laughs> he forgot that wasn't the end of the story. <laughs> yeah, he stopped reading. So do you think that um, at the end of the day, there is an empirical test that that we're going to face if we reject these these truths and say everything is power at the end of the day? that's just not going to work in the world. Like the, the world will reject that way of thinking and it, it would lead to, I mean, I think, you know, Jordan Peterson famously points to the 20th century as an example of, of that kind of thinking not working. Uh, and therefore somehow 
like maybe by the scientific method being rejectable, right? So I think, um, so this is an interesting thing, right? P people deny the assumptions and reject them, but they do it with a particular agenda in mind for a particular aim, but they never apply it consistently throughout their whole life. Um, this is where I think, so the Bible says this about faith. If you want to know what someone believes, you don't look at what they say, look at what they do. Because they will say anything, right, to push a particular agenda. People will say they don't believe in any of these things so that they can have their, but when it comes to how they actually live, everyone believes these assumptions, right? Even the people who don't believe there's truth are going to argue with you, to say there's no truth, and it shows what they do, right? Um, if they've been wronged and someone robs them or you know, kills their child or something like that, they're going to be outraged and say, no, that's wrong. And, and so it's impossible to practically do life without these assumptions. And I think that reveals underneath what people actually believe, as opposed to what they just say they believe. And uh, maybe back to, to science, do you think that um, someone, like, that someone can be an amazing scientist and uh, have absolutely no regard for religion believe that we live in a totally materialistic world like do you think that having even a, re a religious level of faith may, may actually help you in in purely scientific or academic pursuits or do you think they could be totally uh separated like you know richard dawkins i think very successful scientist but doesn't at least outwardly we know we know empirically that people can be uh successful scientists and be aggressive atheists. There's no question about that. I view this as similar to, uh, we know that atheists can be highly moral people. The question is not, can atheists be moral? The question is, can they justify that moral behavior? So I, I see that as an analogous situation. Wes, you had a, your hand raised? Yeah, I was to say something similar. Like, yeah, I think, if, as Dorian said, you know, we have tons of evidence of fantastic scientists or atheists. Um, you know, it would be silly to deny that. Um, but I think, you know, using the same analogy I used previously, is that there is this foundation of in Western civilization that comes from the church that has led to this point. The same way that we, you know, I think they're, I know atheists who are wonderful people. I think they're very moral people. I think they though are sitting on a foundation of that is has its roots in christianity um so while they may not personally believe i think they still gain the benefit from that so I, do you think they're actually like are the atheists in name only and like like do these assumptions uh sort of hint that you actually are not an atheist like if you if you take these assumptions for granted if you believe in these assumptions are you are you can you be atheist is the question i guess at the very least, you would have to say you have to talk about people as a post-Christian atheist or a post-Buddhist atheist, and you would have. To what does that mean? Well, I think you, you know you're influenced by the culture that you grew up in, presumably, and by these assumptions. So, oh, dog is going nuts. He thought it would be the baby, but it was the dog. Uh, so, you don't you think that someone who's a pro a post-Christian atheist might have different uh, cultural assumptions than someone who's a post-Islamic atheist, for example. So when you say post-Christian atheist, you mean someone that started off Christian and turned yeah. atheist? Yeah, I, I, either started off Christian themselves or came from a Christian culture. So, sorry, can you repeat the question? Do I, do I think that a post-Christian atheist would be different or believe yeah. in different? Yeah. yeah. I, do, I do believe that, yes. Yeah, and so... I guess one one place to start is just to sort of acknowledge that uh, there's this long history of ideas and civilizations, and you're embedded in this tradition, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but then I think some atheists will say it. You know, someone like Harari maybe might say this, or you know, so there's some atheists who will say, okay, fine, you know, we, we acknowledge that, but we're going to jettison all of that Stone Age stuff, and now we know better. And I think uh, that's been a sort of popular dominant theme, cultural theme. But uh, I think we've reached the point where we've learned that it just it doesn't work. It's not it, you, you, we can't just get rid of all of that uh, 
cultural baggage. It's important. It's an important part of the whole thing. And the system sort of starts to fall apart without well, it. What, are guess... the, what is it called in the Toba ba I can't say the Hebrew word, but the watery chaos, right? You, you, you turn into the watery chaos without the low. I mean, there's also, uh, yeah, maybe the crazy idea that we can be more than human, right? Like go be transcend our humanity somehow and just become technology, you know? Um, and uh, if, if eventually science leads us there then maybe we'll find out that yeah we were just some sort of material that can be improved upon and eventually we might not even recognize ourselves as as, as actual uh humans right i mean I, i'm trying to get at the whole transhumanism thing here well you were mentioning the tower of babel before right this would yeah, be sort yeah, of the for sure <laughs> instantiation of that yeah, I don't think you had a you had a point. Uh... Um. Yes, I'm trying to remember what it was. Um. Oh, I've forgotten. Uh... No worries. So, have you guys? Uh, had, what kind of feedback have you gotten from this article? Did it? Uh, I mean. It, I was pretty crazy to see that Jordan Peterson tweeted it. Did it, uh, did it make a lot of impressions or how did he even got, come to find it? Do you have any story on, on, on that kind of background? I'm on a email list with him with, uh, it's organized by another Canadian professor and he has like, you know, there's about a dozen dissidents on there, various types of dissidents. I'm a notorious thought criminal. It, I'm not at Jordan Peterson level, but you know, uh, I've opposed cer certain progressive orthodoxies that have gotten me in trouble. And so that's why I was added to this list. And so I sent it to him. That's how, and then he liked it. And so he tweeted it out. Wow. So maybe on, on that topic, I mean, I, I'd love to hear, you know, do you, do you see a future, a, a bright future in academia with this kind of ideology taking over or uh, do you, are you sort of fatalistic and, and, uh, you know, thinking that this might just undermine the whole, the whole institution of, of the academy? Well, I'll start off, but I actually curious to hear what everyone else thinks, especially yeah, Daniel as a young, you know, the youngest person. Um, there's a nice book by Rod Dreher called Live Not By Lies. And uh, I recommend it, but he basically describes how this priest in, I think it was Czechoslovakia and some other priests in Poland, they basically realized what was happening with the, when the Soviets came in and they started setting up these sort of underground networks to that eventually, you know, decades later played a really important role in disrupting the authoritarian system. And so his sort of perspective is like, look, this is, there's a, there's a steamroller coming and what's important to do is to set up systems to, you know, keep the truth alive. And then eventually uh, it, the truth will reemerge re from the ruins. And that's sort of where I am. By the time I retire, you know, it, I could live 30, 30 years more and retire, you know, like past age 70. I'm hopeful that the situation will have improved, but I'm under no illusions that it's going to be great for the foreseeable for the near future. Daniel, any, any thoughts? I mean, I think uh, I'm, I'm maybe in a similar position to you, so I'd love to hear what you're thinking. Um, I'm not optimistic about the academy in the West. I think we're at the decline. I think it's going to get a lot worse. And I mean, I think the root cause of it really is always is the rejection of God. Um, I think academia started right with, at least in the West, with monks in the Middle Ages. So it was done originally for the glory of God. And as a result, it was very, very fruitful. And as soon as that stops being the aim, it takes a long time, but the decline is inevitable. And I mean, again, being a Christian and looking at the bi biblical patterns, like there's usually no restoration without repentance. I think 
um, people need to come back really to a realization that there is a God and that we have turned away from him. And science and all these things should be done for the glory of God. And that would start again a renewal. But from where I see, I think that's a very, very long time. Any thoughts, Wes? Um, I have to think about what Daniel just said. That was uh, really interesting. I've not thought too much about that. Um, yeah, you know, this is not something I think about uh, as much, I think, as uh, Dorian, it sounds like you guys do. But uh, I, I do have to say, I think the one thing that I have noticed as someone who's not as much involved um, as like a thought criminal or something as Dorian put it, which is, is funny, um, is, you know, I, there is definitely this culture, I think, of, of silence. Um, and there's, um, I think there's been a stifling of, you know, just free inquiry, like people are afraid to say the wrong thing or make mistakes. And, and that I find to be concerning, because I think if we're not asking questions, and we're not taking risks, and the penalty for having the wrong idea or asking the wrong questions in a meeting or something, if the penalty of that is high, whether, you know, it's you're losing your job, or it's just ostr being ostracized by your peers, you know, that leads people to really just kind of not, to quiet down, and it, it allows just one ideology to promulgate. And if that is the right ideology, then, you know, great, we're just going to save ourselves a lot of time. Um, but it might not be. And that worries me a little bit. I think a lot of the way knowledge has been developed in you know, society throughout the history of the globe has been through people trying things and being wrong uh, and being okay with that. Um, being okay, making an assumption that, you know, ends up leading down the wrong path. Um, so, you know, I don't know as much about the other things uh, that have been discussed uh, the past couple of minutes, but I think the culture generally around certain taboo topics, that does concern me. Um, and I think it, not just because of me, you know, it concerns me too for students. I think, I mean, the, recently this um, young woman from UVA wrote an op-ed in the New York Times about her, you know, she considers herself to be kind of like with the mentality of a lot of her classmates, but she feels like after saying the wrong thing a few times, she just kind of quiets down. Um, you know, I don't, th I don't think that's healthy for the university as a whole. And I don't think it's just about this, ideology that people tend to be talking mostly about it could be someone could you know the 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 environment could be something that i completely agree with 100 percent of the time but if i am if my side is completely shutting down everyone else we're never going to know when we're wrong and that that's the kind of thing that concerns me is that we may go down the wrong path and there'll be no one there to check us because the people who want to check us you know they out of fear and not unjustified fear stay quiet i guess I would just add two potential secular corrections that could go in the positive direction related to loss of competitiveness. And so one is that uh, I do a lot of work with Chinese colleagues and there's absolutely no indication that they're going along in China with the cuckoo stuff that we're doing here. And so eventually people might say, oh, wait a second, like, you know, if we want to stay a, a world power, we can't we, you know, we have to we have to actually have standards and enforce them, and you know, try to to pick the best people, to do it in a fair way, but try to, you know, not just reject the idea of meritocracy. And then the other thing is an unfortunate, a very unfortunate thing recently is this uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and I think it's easy to argue about silly stuff when you you know you've been on a twenty year bull market and uh, you have actually absolutely no threat to your well-being but when you have you know enemies at the border doing bad stuff you, you know maybe that would cause people to wake up a little and say look you know we actually have to have a robust society we want to choose uh, the best people for the best roles and you know things like that and so those are the potential secular corrections that could could help but I, i'm not super optimistic that's just i'm just throwing that out there that's interesting so it, it, um I'm sure you've read Orthodoxy by Chesterton, when, at least one of you guys, I don't know. Um, but I mean, the, if I focus on one of the aspects that is maybe underlying everything is the, the censorship aspect, right? Like, like, uh, like Wes mentioned, there's certain things you can't talk about at all. Um, you can probably very easily link that idea to religious orthodoxy in some ways, right? There's a blasphemy and there's, you know, certain thoughts that are evil, certain thoughts that are not evil. Um, and do you see that also as some kind of weird uh, 
inversion of religion or, or sort of adoption of it? And is there a place for it in the modern world? Or should we just be advocating for just open thought, discuss whatever you want? Nobody should be silenced at, you know, they can say the craziest things. We're going to be okay with that. You know, how do you sort of balance that line? Um, so I, just, I just thought I'd jump first. And I, I brought that up. I, I don't, I'm not saying like anyone should be able to say like the craziest things. Like I, sure. I'm talking about just like honest dialogue and asking questions and saying like, is this, is this the proper way? Um, and I think the idea that like, I know the proper way, like, you know, whatever my thoughts on like society, culture, um, politics are, if I assume that I, they are 100% right, that's, that's a real, I think it's just a real lack of humility. I think the idea that someone can challenge me on them and show me where I'm wrong is very important. And I think, you know, when it comes to religion, which is kind of like the point of all of this conversation is, I think religion requires some humility. It requires that there are things that I do not know, that there's some things that only God knows. Um, and if I you know, am fortunate enough to, you know, learn them after I'm dead, like that'd be great. But for now, I can't know them. So I think there may be some sort of correlation between people who, you know, value open discussion um, and also have. A, a religious background because I think they both require a good deal of humility. That's not always the case. I'm, there are many atheists who are very for pro. They're very pro free speech and free expression. Um, but I think there's probably some correlation there. But as Dorian said earlier, uh, you know, we should caveat everything. With, I'm not a social scientist. I don't have the the data on that. So if someone wants to prove me wrong, uh, please do. I think the other thing it's important to remember is that it depends on the context. So there's sort of a spectrum of different social situations where more or less free speech might be appropriate. And, uh, you know, on one end you have like kindergarten, right? So, I mean, this is, this is coming up in Florida right now, but you know, it, it, in kindergarten, I think everyone would agree that uh, you shouldn't just talk about anything to kindergartners. And also that the parents, you know, have some should should be able to help determine what gets talked about. But then I would say the exact opposite end of the spectrum is the university. So the university is the space in a in in a society where every idea should be openly discussed, where no one should be shut down. If they have a bad idea, someone should prevent a counter argument. And the fact that it, that uh, the censorship is happening at the university, that a student this student in the New York Times, she self-identified as very liberal. She was pro-abortion and supported Black Lives Matter. And she's having trouble talking at her university because she's not progressive enough, okay? So now just imagine like the average person in the country, uh, you know, like 90% of whom are more conservative than this, than this student is how they are supposed to get through and make their arguments, perfectly valid arguments that just happen to disagree with a certain orthodoxy. And so I think it's incredibly important at the university that this worldview be rejected and that uh, liberal norms be maintained. Yeah, I think there's a value of free speech too, like that, you know, if you, especially within the university context, if you really try to stifle it, those ideas don't go away. Like there are people out there with really bad ideas. Um, I think we've all probably met them, but like if you just stifle them and don't let them, and you don't prove them wrong or show them right while they're wrong, you know, they, they find internet boards where they like, they talk about all kinds of weird stuff. Like, and then those ideas just continue to fester like a virus. I It is better to cleanse them with the disinfectant of sunlight, I think, than to let them bury them underground where they can grow and metastasize. So I think when it comes, you know, it's a really, you know, rather abhorrent ideas. There's, there's a benefit to all of society in letting them be shown for what they are. I think you see that sometimes, like, I mean, I don't follow this stuff too closely, but there's like these weird groups that have these like events and then like the videos up from get out on the internet and like, they're saying all kinds of weird stuff and people just like mock them endlessly. Um, or like at least, you know, make a case for why those people are wrong. I think if we just push it all underground, it's not going to go away. Like the worst parts of our society are not, not just going to disappear if we. A related point is that it reflects uh, an insecurity in your position. You don't have to silence people if you're arguing from a convincing uh, viewpoint and a position of strength. You only have to silence people if you're if you think that other people are going to believe their arguments. 
And so just as an example, I was getting in trouble last fall and they interviewed a professor at Williams College who is one of my you know, main attackers and, in the New York Times. And she, she said something along the line that I don't have the quote in front of me, but this idea of uh, rigor as the pinnacle of intellectualism comes from a world in which white men dominated. And so I, I, every time, you know, every time she got quoted, she said something like this. And I always found this is it, it's great. I loved it when she got quoted and made her argument because I felt like it made my case stronger every time. And so uh, and so that's important to note that you only want to censor when you when when you don't feel like you have a strong argument. Otherwise, you would just. Yeah, I mean, this conversation, even like in writing this article, I think you know we all felt we have a convincing argument for why Christianity and science are compatible, or and you know not mutually exclusive, as some would argue. And then we're having this conversation. I think that you know not to pat ourselves on the back or anything, but I think that shows that we have some confidence in what it is we're talking about. Um, at least to the point where we're able to like put some words down and defend it and make some arguments. I think if we just said there's God in the sky and if you don't listen to us, then you know you're wrong and we will not have any conversation, then you would probably rightfully ignore us. Yeah, I think Perry and I were kind of talking about this before the call, but I think maybe some of it might be coming from the idea that uh, giving people certain information might harm them, right? So you, there are certain things you need to protect people from knowing because they might misinterpret it or they might, you know, uh, share things that will lead to dangerous outcomes. So there's this sort of like protective aspect, right? Well, so you're you're sort of in a in a sense alluding to uh, something that a lot of people have noticed and pointed out, which is that this sort of woke thing is it, it's reaching for Gnost the Gnostic heresy. So this idea that there's there's a, a gnosis, a knowledge that only the special protectors have, and that it can't be shared with the other people, and and that those special protectors are the good people. That original sin isn't spread across everyone. It's concentrated. It's it's very lumpy. It's a lumpy sin is lumpy. It's lumped on certain people, and it doesn't exist on other people, the elect. And so I think you know that's an example of that potentially. Yeah, that's really cool. I didn't know about that. Yeah, you should read about that. I mean, there are, there are some striking parallels. I mean, one, there, a later Gnostic tradition, these French, Southern French guys from like 1200, I forget what they were called exactly, but they had this group and it, it was, they believed that, um, uh, human beings are sexless angels uh, who are imprisoned in the body in our bodies uh, which starts to sound a lot like progressive oh my uh, God. <laughs> narratives yeah, yeah that's crazy <laughs> well it's very interesting i mean and in general the, the gnostic the gnostic heresies all have in common this idea of that uh, that the physical world is evil and mm -hmm. that there's some spiritual world that's better and even, you know, they'll be explicit sometimes and say, like, you know, some evil God created the physical world and we have to escape from it. We have to get away. And you can really see that with a lot of the current progressive uh, ideology. Wow. But I guess maybe uh, going back to what you mentioned, that there's a certain protectorate of the truth and they're the ones that will know what to do with it. I guess there's probably some truth to that, right? Like not everybody can understand uh, a scientific paper and really know uh, how to deal with it, right? So uh, there, there might be real world examples where that's taken, that's actually caused damage, right? I, I mean, I think, I don't know too much about this, but you know, the, the original anti-vax uh, autism stuff, I think was taken from a paper that got retracted later on and, and people sort of went on with it. So um, I, I might be wrong about that, but that's, that's what I've been hearing. Um, that does, I guess, happen in the real world. So maybe that kind of motivates the notion that, okay, well, we should only trust the experts, right? And they're gonna tell us what to do because they were trained and we shouldn't be questioning that. So um, yeah, I wonder if, if that kind of resonates, right? No, so it doesn't resonate. So. 
uh, what do you think is going to convince people better to say, oh, trust us, trust us. And the thing we told you two weeks ago, we changed our mind about, we had a dogma, but now we've changed our mind and we've got a new dogma, trust us, we know everything. Or to say, look, here's the evidence we have, you know, we're gonna explain it, we're gonna break it down to you as well as you can, we can, mm -hmm. but here's what we know and here's what we don't know. Mm -hmm. And you know, we could be wrong, we're like 95% confident, but we could be wrong. Which do you think is going to engage the population and convince them better? Yeah, I guess there's some transparency, but you know, if, if someone were to tell me something about quantum mechanics, I, I would have to be like, all right, are you, are, you, are, are you known to be good at this? And then even your, your statement about your confidence about that fact, I'll have to sort of somehow take on, on faith, right? All I'm saying is if it gets to the level of having to convince the public, then you owe it to the public to try to explain it in a way that people can understand. I mean, I, people are not dum-dums, right? You know, like you, you, people who don't happen to have had an education, it doesn't mean that they're just dum-dums. You, you can figure out a way to try to explain it. Yeah, I think not everyone's an expert in everything. We have division of labor for a reason, but you know, people can smell bullshit. And you know, so if you're, if that's what you're putting out, people will detect that. And I mean, that's, that's happened within the church too. I mean, that's like what part of what led to the reformation is, you know, there was a concentration of power and it was being abused. So like th that can happen. And so I think whether it's, you know, people who run our churches or whether it's us as scientists or whatever, we have a responsibility to, you know, be as honest as we can, as truthful as we can and communicate very clearly and be humble when we don't know something. I think that's important for everyone um, because we, ha we have a division of labor because we can't all do everything. I can't be my own lawyer, my own accountant, my own doctor. I can't do all these things. I have to trust other people, but they then need to make sure that they're doing what they need to do to earn my trust the same way that I do that for them. So I, it, it's weird because sometimes I feel like people that claim that something is unscientific use the least amount of science to explain their position. So they'll say something like, this is safe without explaining, say, a confidence interval of how safe something is, or like just being explicit about what they know and don't know. They'll just say the science tells us a broad statement. The science tells us this is safe or unsafe, or the science says we should do this instead of actually explaining the observation and the, and the conclusion of what they're, they're, they're trying to study. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And then there's also the term pseudoscience. Oh, well, that pseudoscience, uh, when, some, when you disagree with something, and it reminds me of the old Kremlin strategy from the Soviet days, where you would just accuse your enemy of whatever you were doing. <laughs> Sorry, Wes, you had something to add? Or? Yeah. I think this gets back to what I was saying earlier, though, which is that you have this, you have this idea like, oh, this is what the science says. And I, I don't think that's, I, I never really find that convincing. Like, I, I find that when somebody says, follow the science, I, I love when I hear that phrase, because I know that I now no longer need to listen to what you have to say, because you're not going to make a good point, probably. It, you know, science doesn't tell us to close schools for two years, you know, if, like they did by me. Um, some people wanted that, some people didn't. You know, my kids aren't in school yet, so that wasn't something that really affected me. But that's not what science didn't tell us that. That's a decision we made based on data. And whether it was the wrong decision or the right decision, you know, that's up for debate. I have my views on it. Um, but the science didn't tell us anything about that. So I just think when we say, like, you know, we need to listen to science or trust the science, I think, it, first of all, it cuts out a lot of people. Like, how many people are really scientists? Like, maybe in our world, like everyone we know is a scientist because we work in this area. But most people don't know anyone who's like a real like scientist like who goes to a lab every day and tinkers around and you know look like the guy on the brochure just like looks at a vial that has a color in it like pensively you know that's not something a lot of people do like so this idea that we want all everyone to trust these people that they've never met just completely on blind faith doesn't make a ton of sense to me and that's why i think going back to my earlier point the same way that i think church leaders need to earn our trust um and they have not always been great at that you know, someone said earlier, like, why is it that, you know, religion has fallen away? You know, I think for me as a Catholic, I should recognize that the church has not always been great. You know, there's that whole, you know, molesting children thing that happened that that's not going to inspire a lot of people to join your church. And it really shakes the faith of the people who, who are looking at it. Um, so I think when we're looking at what we're doing as scientists, we need to keep that in mind, too.
and, and I think even scientists can understand the the data or whatever, but they're still maybe not qualified to make a decision on whether we should close schools or not, right? I, I, there's an there's an extra piece on top where you have to balance a bunch of other things besides just a scientific observation. Yeah, because first of all, I mean, I'm a scientist, but I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm not the one who should be making you know decisions about your healthcare. Um, I mean, you you don't want me to be doing that. That would be probably pretty bad for you. But the other thing is, I mean, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If your job is to keep you know this one particular virus at bay at all costs, then you're going to do that. But that might lead to other harms that you're not considering. And that's why I think this idea that we should only focus on you know the science, capital T, capital S, like I don't think that's a good way for society to be organizing itself. And to kind of bring it back, I think to you know what we're talking about, like the overarching theme here. I think a lot of people who have removed God from their lives have put science in there. Um, and that's something that makes, I don't think that's the best thing for society as a whole. Well, another way you can look at that phrase is it's designed to close conversations, whereas actual science is designed to open up investigations. And so that's a problem. And then the other thing you can notice is that the people who like to say trust the science, they also aren't super into trusting the science in certain, when science says certain other things for example, related to uh, when a human being becomes a, a human being or uh, whether uh, human beings are sexually dimorphic. <laughs> uh, science certainly does, yeah, it, it starts conversations and it should not be trusted, it should be, it should be probed and questioned. And I think about my first paper that I submitted as a faculty member, I submitted it, the editor, God bless her, she sent it out for review. Um, and I said, because it was God awful. And I got these reviews back and there were some real questions in there about like, have you done this? Have you considered these things? And then I went back to the lab and I actually put out what I was, I'm actually pretty proud of that paper now. Um, but you know, the first go at it, it wasn't that great. The idea that you should just trust me because I'm saying like, oh, this is what I did and this is what's happening unquestioningly and uncritically would have led to me publishing some real garbage science. Um, and now I put out what I think is, you know, actually pretty useful. So this idea that I think science, it really does spark conversation. That's when you, when you go to conferences, like I'm sure you guys see this, there's people always asking questions and like sometimes even get a little bit heated, but that's a good thing. That's how we get to the truth of the matter. And another way to say, go on Daniel. Sorry, I lost. An another way to say all this is that you, um, science doesn't tell anyone what they ought to do. It's just, you can't derive moral imperatives from just statements about the facts. You need a moral framework on top of it that actually says, okay, therefore do this. Um, and I think this, people are rejecting the moral framework, but then filling it with something that they don't understand. And, and that's the source of all the, yeah. I think it's, it's crazy how poorly or how poorly understood that simple statement is that science can't tell you what to do. I think a lot of people have never spent like two minutes to think about that. And I think just that could probably lead a lot of people down a better direction, in, in, in my opinion. Um, and okay, so I, I think we're at the one and a half hour mark. I'm sure you guys have a lot of other things to do. And I think that's a really, really nice place to, to end it. Um, I want to thank you all so, so much for joining. And I hope you had a good time. We, we certainly did. Any Thanks. closing remarks? Your Thanks, last. Carlos. That was awesome. Yes, yeah, and like if anyone you. has anything to, to wrap up with, please. Uh, uh, nothing special for me, but I just want to say uh, thanks. It's a lot of fun. I enjoyed the conversation. Um, and yeah, you know, if anyone has any questions they want to follow up, um, this is something I think we are all very clearly excited to talk about, this, this synergy between Christianity and, um, and science. So uh, you can look us up send us an email. I, at least speaking for myself, I'd be really happy to continue this conversation elsewhere. Yeah, I'll post all the information on the video. So I'm sure people will find you. All right. Keep us posted on any future articles. Well, yeah, subscribe to that heterodox STEM sub stack. You know, there's articles going up there once a week or so that you might be interested in. So I'll put that link also, I guess, Carlos, in the description. Of course, as always. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Hope to see you soon. Bye. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.